Earth Science, the Atmosphere. Showing two different baseball fields here, one in Wrigley Field, um, Chicago, and the Coors Field in Denver, Colorado. Well, why is it easier to hit home runs in Coors Field? Well, Colorado's a mile high, the atmosphere's thinner there, and so baseballs fly further in the Denver, Colorado field than they would in Chicagoland. So the atmosphere. Well, the atmosphere is a mix of gases that surround the Earth. And you can see um, a picture of the Earth and then a sea of just a thin layer of gases that surround the Earth. The atmosphere is critical for life on the Earth. It protects us from harmful radiation. It protects us from incoming projectiles. They burn up in the atmosphere. Um, the lowest part of the atmosphere touches the surface of the Earth, and the upper part of the atmosphere gradually transitioned into space. And you can see the atmosphere from the Earth just as a real thin shell covering the Earth. And it just makes you appreciate just how precious life is on the Earth when you see that. Let's think about some questions. One question, what are some ways in which human beings interact with the atmosphere? Of course, we breathe it. That's one way. Um, we fly through it in airplanes. So there's all kinds of ways. Think of some other ways that human beings interact with the atmosphere. And describe the variations you've observed in the atmosphere from where you live and where you've traveled. What are some things you've seen in the atmosphere that are different from one place to another? And another question might be, what characteristics of the atmosphere have you seen typically in weather forecasts? I remember looking across, um, I was actually in Kenya at the time, and I was looking across the valley toward Mount Kenya, and I could see a tornado forming in the atmosphere. It just didn't go all the way to the ground. I could just see a spike forming down off some storm clouds. It was really interesting. It was so far away, you could clearly see that, that funnel cloud. Well, um, God created the atmosphere, and um, what did he put in the atmosphere? Um, the early earth had a very different atmosphere than we have now. The early earth, was, early earth was mostly methane and other gases that would be poisonous to life. Now we have mostly nitrogen and oxygen as our atmosphere. We have about 21% oxygen. It hasn't always been like that, but um, um, now we have 21% oxygen. Then we have carbon dioxide that, that plays a small part, but plays a very important role in helping warm, keep the earth warmer as a, with, as a greenhouse effect. Um, water vapor in the air can change from zero to seven percent, depending on uh, where you, you are on the earth, um, whether you're in a rainforest area or whether you're in a desert. How much oxygen was present in the earth's atmosphere four billion years ago? Much less than now, hardly any. And um, when God first created the earth, there was no oxygen when the planet was first formed. And as the earth cooled, water condensed, it rained, it removed carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And um, God made primitive organisms, um, but very critical to um, um, eventually creating life on earth as we know it, that would consume carbon dioxide and produce oxygen on the earth. And so oxygen accumulated in the oceans but not the atmosphere initially until about two billion years ago when we started getting more oxygen in the atmosphere and not just um, the water, the oceans of the earth. One thing that's important is oxygen is reactive and so those early, ro early rocks did not rust because there wasn't oxygen to make them rust. Um, so a key point, life was created on earth before there was free oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. And I'll just read part of Genesis 1 here. God said, let the land produce vegetation, plants yielding seeds according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit according, fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants yielding seeds according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed and according to their kinds. God saw that it was good. Um, here we have a picture of algae and um, it is important that God 
created plants on the earth in order to have oxygen. And he created bacteria on the early earth, a type of bacteria called cyanobacteria. We can even see that in places today in um, Australia or Mexico. And that bacteria, um, 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 it, it, it's, it's, in a, it's in an algae, and um, the, um, that type of bacteria is very, very efficient at taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and putting oxygen back in the atmosphere. And so the very early Earth, God had created these plants to um, help increase the amount of oxygen that we have now. Um, the earliest animals on Earth lived on oceans. Um, oceans are protected from harmful solar, ra solar radiation. Um, then once oxygen accumulated in the Earth's atmosphere, then um, God create, could create um, life on, the, um, on land. Also on land, there's an, on the atmosphere, there's an ozone layer. And that um, ozone layer is important for life on land because it protects us from harmful ultraviolet radiation. And um, here we can see the age of the Earth on the horizontal diagram and the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere um, according to percentage. And um, PAL is the present atmospheric level, so 100% is present. So we see the early Earth, there was hardly any oxygen at all. And then at some point um, after God had created the um, cyanobacteria and algae, um, there was enough oxygen on the Earth um, about two and a half billion years ago that um, we started seeing more life. And then, a, um, then about half a billion years ago, we see a huge jump in the amount of life on the Earth when oxygen hit close to present day levels. So, the other thing we see that's interesting about oxygen levels on the Earth um, since uh, the um, explosion of life at the start of the Cambrian is that during the major extinctions we start to see um, decreases of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. There's a correspondence level. And so here I've mapped out um, the percentage of oxygen in the atmosphere and you see a lower spike that tends to map um, at least four, with four out of the uh, five different um, major extinctions over um, um, the time when there's been just been an explosion of life on the earth. Well having an atmosphere is not unique to the earth but the earth's atmosphere is unique in its composition. Um, both Venus and Earth began with very similar atmospheres that were rich in carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and oxygen. And um, atmospheres originated from gases ex expelled from extensive volcanism and collision with comets and meteorites. Um, well, Venus being closer to the sun had ab abundant water vapor, and this uh, vapor was split into hydrogen and oxygen because it's so close to the sun. And that hydrogen was lost into space, and so the remaining oxygen got bonded with carbon and created lots of carbon dioxide on Venus. And so Venus has so much carbon dioxide that it insulates the planet. You get very, very hot, um, hot temperatures on the surface of Venus that you don't get on the Earth because one, we're further away from the sun, and two, we just don't have the amount of carbon dioxide um, that, that uh, Venus has. So uh, when oxygen, uh, when would oxygen have started to accumulate in the atmosphere if the early Earth had fewer land masses? Well, it would have um, started to accumulate before two and a half. And um, gravity holds 99% of the atmospheric gas within 20 miles of the Earth's surface. So most of the atmosphere is just within that 20 miles of the Earth's surface. Um, and uh, some things about that 20 miles of air, the density of the air rapidly decreases as you go up in altitude. 
and the accepted boundary of space is 62 miles above the Earth's surface, although there's a few gas molecules there, hardly any, but it's, it's where we consider space to start. Um, some gas must extend as high as 312 miles because up to that point spacecraft can feel some drag from that gas. Just a few molecules of gas and the spacecraft can feel it. Um, atoms in water are air and constantly in motion and we call that kinetic energy. And kinetic energy increases as speed of atomic motion increases. Well, what we call heat is the total kinetic energy of all atoms in a substance. And what we call temperature is the average kinetic energy of a substance measured for a given quantity of that substance. So temperature is average kinetic energy, and heat is the total kinetic energy. And here we have two pans of water that are heated to the same temperature at the same amount of time. So they contain the same amount of heat. Uh, which is spread across um, the water molecules of each pan, but the uh, saucepan in two has a higher temperature um, because the heat would have produced more rapid motion among fewer water molecules. Okay, so to put that another way, you got a half a pan of water and a full pan of water, and you put them on the same temperature in the same amount of time. Well, duh. <laughs> the uh, pan with less water in it's going to heat up a lot faster. I do that when I make tea. Put less water in the teapot and it heats up quicker. There we go. So water has a high heat capacity. So that's uh, water. Um, water has a much higher heat capacity than air. In fact air is a quarter that of water. In other words water absorbs a lot of heat um, in order for temperature to increase. If the same amount of heat were applied to a similar mass of air and water, which would experience a greater temperature? Well, air would, because air does not have the heat capacity that water does. So what's the difference between heat and temperature? Well, we gave a kinetic energy um, answer earlier, and that was that heat deals with total kinetic energy and temperature with average kinetic energy. Now we're going to start looking at how the atmosphere changes from the surface of the earth on up into space. And to start talking about that, let's, let's talk about a, a man in 1960, Captain Joe Kittinger, who with the U.S. Air Force, jumped from a balloon 20 miles up in the atmosphere. Um, airplanes fly about 6.8 miles high he jumped from 20 miles high. And what he was doing was researching whether astronauts could bail out from a troubled spacecraft still in the atmosphere. Remember 1960, we were still trying to figure out how to put um, a man on, uh, out into space. By 1969, we landed on the moon. So lots of experimentation happening in those nine years. Well, during his ascent, the balloon expanded and the sky turned black. Uh, he was protected by a pressurized suit. He had an oxygen supply. There's not enough oxygen to breathe up there. And he could see the curvature of the Earth on the horizon. Uh, while he fell, he uh, reach, reached a speed of 614 miles an hour. And the Earth was coming up at him at f um, um, for about four minutes and um, before he deployed his parachute. Well, there's four layers in the atmosphere. At the lowest layer toward on the Earth's surface is what we call the troposphere, uh, which goes up about 10 kilometers. And um, above that is uh, the stratosphere, which goes up to about 50 kilometers. In between those is what's called the tropopause. Above that is a mesosphere, which goes up to about 85 kilometers. In between that is the stratopause. Then um, above the mesosphere is a thermosphere, and between that is the mesopause. So you have the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, and thermosphere. Um, so let's look at the troposphere to start with. We're going to look at each of these 
parts of the atmosphere. Well, what we have here is, our, is a diagram that shows a temperature and the temperature decreases with altitude. So it gets cold as you go up in the troposphere. Um, it gets its warmth from the Earth's surface. Um, all of our weather is in the troposphere. Um, all of our air pollution is in the troposphere. Um, air and aerosols are in the troposphere. And um, its thickness varies on the thermal character, in other words, how, how warm it is. So it's thickest over the equator, um, up to 10 miles, or um, about, um, let's see, that's about uh, 15 kilometers. And thinnest over the equator, or thinnest over the poles, about 5 miles high or about uh, eight kilometers high. So it's thickest over the equator and thinnest over the poles. That's the troposphere. The stratosphere, the next layer up, it, um, uh, it increases in temperature as you go up. It's about 25 miles thick and it contains a little over 20% 20, 20 of the atmosphere's air. Um, the ozone resides in the stratosphere, and the ozone layer blocks ultraviolet rays from um, coming into the Earth, and so it, it's important for life on Earth. And the temperature increase in this stratosphere is due to absorption of solar radiation by the ozone molecules. Um, there's a higher kinetic energy there because there's nothing to bump into, so those molecules move around a lot faster. Um, the cool air of the troposphere can't rise into the stratosphere, so it, um, it's, it's allowed to get warmer because of that solar radiation, creating higher kinetic energy. So let's ask a couple questions here before we go to the mesosphere and the thermosphere. At approximately what temperature did Captain Joe Kitchinger uh, begin his descent upon ex exiting from his balloon capsule? Well, there was his altitude, about 30 kilometers or about um, 20 miles high, and it would have been about f minus 25 degrees Celsius. So he was way up halfway in the stratosphere before he bailed out. Another question, at extremely low temperatures, the thick polyethylene fabric of Joe Kitchinger's balloon would have been nearly brittle. At small flaws in the fabric, um, that would have caused the balloon to spring a leak and deflate. So what location during the ascent would the risk of this potential danger have been most acute? Well, it would have been at the upper troposphere because that's where the atmosphere is thickest, but then also that's where it's coldest. Because notice that the uh, stratosphere starts to warm up. And so his balloon would have started warming up once it got into the stratosphere. Okay, let's move from the stratosphere to the mesosphere. In the mesosphere, uh, the temperature gets colder and reaches a minus of um, um, 100 degrees, minus 100 centigrade, about 139, minus 139 Fahrenheit. So the temperature minimum is at the mesopause, and the temperature decreases due to fewer and fewer ozone molecules to absorb ultraviolet radiation. So less and less ozone so less and less kinetic energy, and so less and less temperature. Very little oxygen and nitrogen's there. Um, and, but you do have gas enough to burn up um, meteors that come into the atmosphere. So a lot of the meteors will start burning up in the mesosphere. And um, most near-Earth objects burn, burn up in the mesosphere. It was important to talk about the difference between temperature and heat earlier because when we get into the thermosphere, that's really clear. Um, heat is what keeps you from freezing. So even though the temperature in the thermosphere is very hot, up to uh, over 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, because the solar radiation um, really makes the air molecules, the very few air molecules up there, very, very hot. There's not very many of them, so you don't have very much heat. So, because heat is the total kinetic energy, uh, you don't feel very warm, and you would freeze very quickly if you were in the thermosphere.
On the other hand, uh, temperature is the average kinetic energy, and so the average kinetic energy of each of those molecules is very high. The thermosphere is where that what blocks most of the um, X rays, gamma rays, and some ultraviolet coming off the sun, the short wavelength light. And um, gases in the thermosphere are ionized, and because they're ionized, um, you can see auroras. And so there's an interaction of the Earth's um, magnetism at each of the poles and uh, the electrons from those in those ionized gases interact with the protons for the sun and create beautiful lights. We call those um, the aurora borealis in the north and the aurora australis in the south. The sun emits electromagnetic radiation or EMR and um, it's described by its wavelength and frequency. In fact each star has a unique EMR and you can identify the star um, by looking at um, the um, type of um, EMR coming off of that star. Well, the sun gives off quite a bit of visible light, and the short wave gamma rays, X rays, and ultraviolet light are blocked in the atmosphere, um, and infrared comes on through somewhat and helps warm the Earth. So, if we look at a chart, we see um, lots of ultraviolet light hitting the surface of the Earth with some infrared light hitting the surface of the earth and uh, most of the other lights blocked out from the sun. Most of the other EMR is blocked out because of um, our atmosphere or the shortwave stuff is blocked out because of our atmosphere. Here, here's one more diagram of that showing the thermosphere blocking out x-rays, gamma rays and short wave radiation wavelength, wavelength radiation. The stratosphere because of the um, ozone layer absorbs ultraviolet ways and um, each of those when I say block out really the, the word is to absorb those wavelengths so that they don't hit the surface of the earth and the visible light then comes on through the atmosphere and hits the surface of the earth. It's just a marvelous way that God has used to um, provide protection for life on the earth uh, without the atmosphere this way it would um, be very difficult to live on the surface of the earth. Well the ozone hole over Antarctica actually represents a thinning of the ozone layer. So what's the consequences of loss of ozone? Well, um, it has nothing to do with global warming, but it does have to do with um, uh, managing environment factors that affect the atmosphere. Well the problem with thinning the ozone over in the, in the Earth's atmosphere is it reduces the amount of um, damaging ultraviolet or it increases the amount of ultraviolet um, light that hits the earth and um, creates uh, more skin cancer. Well what happens to EMR or electric magnetic radiation when it reaches the earth? Well it's scattered and it can change direction when it hits particles and gas molecules and that's what causes the blue sky. The reason our sky is blue is because light is scattered and because of um, uh, <clears throat> because blue light is scattered more easily than other cutter colors um, the blue light reaches our eyes and makes the sky blue. If you go further up in the atmosphere there's fewer gas molecules and less scattering and the sky appears black but there's still an atmosphere there. So one thing that happens when EMR hits the Earth's surface, it's scattered. Second thing that happens is it's reflected. Some of the radiation um, that hits the uh, um, gas molecules is reflected in its base, but then it's also reflected off the surface of the Earth, and what we call that the albedo, the albedo, A L B E D O, and that has to do with the reflectivity of the surface of the earth. Um, ice because it's white is very reflective. Forests and water because they are not white are not reflective and that has an impact and let's talk about that impact a little bit. Albedo. Well some electromagnetic radiation is absorbed um, 
It interacts with material in the atmosphere and is converted into some other forms of energy, mostly heat. And atmospheric gases can absorb certain wavelengths, and the thermosphere absorbs short, short wavelengths. The ozone and stratosphere absorbs ultraviolet. Um, water vapor and carbon dioxide in the troposphere absorb infrared energy. But some solar radiation hits the Earth's surface, and praise God that it does. And uh, some is absorbed by the land and oceans, and um, about half of the incoming solar radiation heats the Earth. And so 50% um, of the um, sun's radiation hits is absorbed by the Earth's surface. Um, and 19% um, is absorbed by clouds. Well, 30%, and these are averages, is scattered and reflected from clouds in the atmospheres and Earth's surface. So we're, let's talk about that 30%. Well, we call that the Earth's albedo. Um, it's about 30%. Um, if you look at fresh snow, it reflects 80 to 95% of the sun that hits it. So that's why you need to wear sunglasses and goggles when you go skiing in the mountains. Pine forests only reflect about 9%. Uh, if you have a dark roof in your house, it um, reflects 8 to 18% and the rest of it just heats up your attic so it's not efficient to have a dark roof whereas if you have a light roof it reflects 35 to 50 percent so you want to have a light roof unless you want to warm your house up um, the reason you can fry an egg on the sidewalk um, or blacktop in the summer is because it absorbs most of the sunlight and only reflects five to ten percent of the sunlight that hits it so the rest of it just heats up, and um, in the hot August day, you can fry an egg on it because it just gets hot. Um, so on and so forth. Um, so the Earth has an albedo, and it's important to understand something about that um, when you look at um, the surface of the Earth and how much solar radiation is absorbed by the Earth as opposed to... Um, uh, bouncing back into the atmosphere or into space. Well, which has the highest albedo? Well, snow does, because it's bright white. Um, let's segue to the greenhouse effect here. Well, the surface of the Earth with low albedo absorbs solar radiation and re-radiates it as infrared or long radi wavelength radiation. And this long wavelength radiation, infrared radiation, is then absorbed by the greenhouse gases such as water vapor, carbon dioxide, and other trace gases like methane and nitrous oxide. And um, this absorption causes the troposphere to warm and you get a greenhouse effect. And the greenhouse effect helps keep the earth livable. So we have an average of about um, 33 degrees warmer than if there were no greenhouse effect. And uh, so the Earth would be really cold without some greenhouse effect. So the average surface of the Earth would be about zero degrees Fahrenheit, in other words, um, 32 degrees below freezing, without a greenhouse effect. As it is, we have a current average temperature in the Earth of about 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so praise God that we have carbon dioxide in the Earth and um, uh, the albedo which uh, puts um, uh, longer wavelength radiation back into the atmosphere, interacting with um, greenhouse gases, mostly carbon dioxide, and keeping the Earth warmer because of that. Well, how does the wavelength of EMR, or electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation, emitted from the Earth compared to that absorbed by the Earth? Well, it's longer because it's... it's um, it's um, absorbing short wavelength stuff, shorter wavelength stuff, and giving off uh, infrared, which is heat, back into the atmosphere. Okay, so let's look at um, the interaction of EMR with the Earth and uh, how that would affect global temperatures. Well, if the atmosphere was thicker, you'd have a decrease in temperature because you'd have more electromagnetic re reflection. If the atmosphere had more carbon dioxide in it, 
it would increase the temperatures, global temperatures, because it would trap um, heat. If the atmosphere had more aerosols in it, then it would decrease the temperature because of more EMR reflection. If the atmosphere contained more black soot, like it did back in um, Europe with burning lots of coal without scrubbers on them, then it would increase the temperature because of more EMR absorption. If trees were white in color instead of mostly green, um, it would decrease temperatures on Earth because you'd have more EMR reflection. And if there were no ice on Earth, the temperatures would increase uh, due to more EMR absorption. Well, water is the only substance that exists in all three states on the Earth's surface. Frozen, liquid, and as a gas or water vapor. And the atmosphere contains a small portion of the Earth's water. The volume of water falling as precip precipitation is actually 30 times greater than the volume stored in the atmosphere at any given time. Um, water is constantly cycled through the atmosphere. We've talked about the um, hydrologic cycle. And conversion of water from one state to another transfers energy throughout the troposphere. Remember, the troposphere is the very lowest level of the atmosphere. Uh, water molecules are dipolar. <clears throat> And so you have opposite charges on each end of the molecule. And the states of water are defined by the distance between water molecules and their degree of motion. So in the case of ice, you have closely spaced water molecules, and they move less, and they're more ordered. In the case of liquid water, you have small groups of molecules that are attached <clears throat> with rapid movement that create some disorder. And with a gas or water vapor, you have individual molecules that move very rapidly and therefore don't attract or join and are very... Uh, there's changes of state between frozen liquid and, and gaseous water um, result from the absorption or release of heat. And we call that heat latent heat. Much more latent heat is released or absorbed during changes between liquid and gaseous states than between solid and, ga and liquid states. So between uh, water vapor and liquid water, there's much more latent heat necessary to change those states than to freeze water or to melt water. Um, so it's important to know that heat is absorbed when you melt an ice cube, and heat is released when you freeze, an, uh, freeze water to an ice cube. Um, same with uh, when you uh, evaporate liquid water to a water vapor, heat is absorbed and uh, heat is released when you take water vapor and turn it into water. Well, what changes, what happens to the temperature of ice as it changes state to a liquid? Well, the temperature changes the same. The temperature doesn't change when ice changes to a liquid. Only once it's a liquid, then it warms up. Uh, evaporation and condensation are very important. They occur over large areas, and that's what is a major contribution to weather phenomena and redistribution of heat in the atmosphere. And um, so here you have a picture of evaporation and condensation between liquid water and um, sublimation and disposition, deep, d dis deposition of, um, <clears throat> of, of uh, snow or ice in the, over land. And uh, then you have melting and freezing between uh, liquid water and um, solid water. So no, don't make this harder than it is. This is just trying to show you that uh, water changes state. So your body feels coo cooler when you step out of a warm shower. Why? Well, because water starts to evaporate from your skin once you step out of that shower. Humidity is the amount of moisture in the air, and the amount of humidity you have is determined by uh, evaporation and condensation. Hot and humid go together. Higher temperatures cause evaporation, 
and uh, air is saturated with can, when it can hold no more water vapor at, at a given temperature. And there's two types of humidity that we need to talk about. Um, one is absolute humidity, which is the mass of water and the volume of air, just how much water is in air. That's absolute humidity. But more useful when we talk about atmosphere is relative humidity. And relative humidity is the amount of water vapor in the air compared to the maximum mass of water vapor the air could hold if it was saturated. And so there you see a graph. And let's take the top blue line at 100%. Notice that at 40 degrees um, centigrade, that you can hold much more water in the air than you can at, say, 10 degrees centigrade. Well, um, you may have noticed that uh, when uh, you're outside in the winter and then come inside, the temperature goes up, hopefully, if you have um, a heater in your house. Well, the, temp the air in the atmosphere doesn't have much water in it because it's cold outside. Well, that air is not um, any different in the house than it is outside of the house, but as soon as you warm it up, it still has that very low um, amount of water in it. And so, but relative to the amount of water it could, could hold, suddenly it feels dry in the house. And that's, that's what we're talking about when we talk about relative humidity. You could hold a lot more water vapor in the atmosphere in a warm house in the winter than you can in the cold air outside during the winter. Um, so there is relative humidity. Uh, measurements reveal that a cubic meter of air at 12 degrees actually holds 6 grams of water. What happens if temperature of the air increases? And explain your answer. Well. Absolute humidity rate remains constant, but relative humidity decreases because of the um, temperature of the air increase. Uh, when cold air moves over warm water, some of the warm water evaporates. And we call that a steam fog. Uh, when warm air moves over cold water, the air cools. And a term you, you need to know when we talk about the atmosphere is dew point. Well, dew point is the temperature air must reach in order to become saturated. And saturated is 100% uh, when, it's, when it's holding as much water as it can hold um, at the temperature. So the temperature air must reach in order to become saturated. And condensation occurs when relative humidity of air increases enough that the air becomes saturated with moisture. So. Condensation just mean it rains or snows or something. And so when the air increases enough to become saturated, then that's when condensation occurs. Well, humidity can increase in two ways then. And think back to that relative humidity graph we just looked at. You can add water to the air or you can decrease temperature. Um, explain why people can see their breath on a cold winter's day in terms of water changing state and latent heat. So why can you see your breath in the winter? Well, breath has moisture in it. And each time you breathe out, water vapor is coming, comes out with your breath. And, it's, and to stay in a gaseous form, though, it needs energy to keep the molecules moving. Well, inside your lungs, it's nice and warm. You have that energy, and that latent heat exists. But when you exhale and it's cold outside, that water vapor in your breath, it loses energy because it doesn't have that latent heat anymore and then rather than move freely the water molecules begin to pack themselves closely and those that breath you see is actually um, condensation so, or, or it turns into ice and so when they slows down that water um, either turns into liquid or solid form of water depending how cold it is I'll explain why a hair dryer actually dries your hair rather than leaving it a hot wet sticky mess. What process is taking place there? Well, what a hair dryer does is simply evaporates the water in your hair and allows that water to return to the atmosphere in gaseous form. Um, <clears throat> atmospheric pressure 
And one of the things we're doing here is defining lots of terms we'll use in the next chapter when we talk about weather. But atmospheric pressure is the pressure exerted by the weight of an overlying column of air. So um, higher atmospheric pressure means that you've got a column of air above you that weighs more. And air pressure declines with increasing altitude. Well, the, yeah, duh, you go up, you have less air above you, so you have less atmospheric pressure. Okay. Well, that's why um, you can hit a ball further in Coors Field in Denver than you can in Chicagoland at Wrigley Field because the air pressure is lower. Well, air pressure is influenced by air density. Air density is the measurement of uh, mass of atoms and molecules in the gas per a certain volume. So you, you take a bucket of air and um, take that bucket up way up high in the atmosphere and it's going to have less air molecules in it than when it's down low. Well, because of gravity, most of the air is closer to the Earth's surface. And 50% of all air lies within below 3 miles of altitude, or in the lower troposphere. And there you see a, a diagram of pressure in millibars of, um, of uh, where the air pressure is. So, question is, why do airplanes like to fly higher? Well, air pressure is less high up there, and so it doesn't take as much fuel to fly higher as it does lower because there's not as much air friction to fly against. Air contracts when it's cooled, and that increases density. Molecules are closer together, and uh, air expands when it's warmed, so that decreases density and air pressure. And the highest air pressure are found in cold regions. And the lowest air pressures are found in tropical warm environments. Um, air pressure decreases rapidly at lower altitudes where air density is greatest and decreases slowly at higher altitudes. Each of the following images best represents, best, best approximates the distribution of two principal gases in the Earth's atmosphere. So oxygen and nitrogen, and nitrogen about 78%, oxygen about um, 21%. So which shows those distribution of gases the best? Well, A does, because most of the gases are at the bottom of the troposphere, the lower half of the troposphere, and not evenly distributed like B, not at the top of the troposphere like C, and not in layers like in D. So let's recall Joe Kittinger's descent. His balloon expanded on his descent when he was going up. Why did it expand? Well, it expanded because the air pressure outside the balloon was decreasing. In other words, um, there's less air molecules out there. So that led to an expansion of the helium inside the balloon. A compressed air becomes warmer and expanding air becomes cooler. So what happens with your tires? Well, tire pressures are typically twice that of the surrounding air. And when you release air out of the tire, it comes out and feels cold. Um, hopefully, you've had an opportunity to air up the tires on your car and experience that. If not, get somebody to show you how, because everybody needs to know how to air up and take air out of their tires. Um, in the winter, uh, the tires will decrease in pressure because it's colder out and so you'll need to air up your tires in the winter when it gets cold but don't air them up too much or don't remember to take air out of your tires as soon as summer heat comes or you may over inflate your tires it's important to check your tires every winter and every spring and every fall um, anyway when you let air out of your tires it's called an adiabatic change and it, it changes because of a change in pressure with no loss or gain of energy. So you simply take a high pressure air in your, in your car tires and let it out. It gets cold um, because of an adiabatic change. Um, <clears throat> a meteor that burns up in the atmosphere um, burns up not as a result of frictional heating. The incoming meteor slows down and compresses the gases of the upper atmosphere, causing the temperature 
in those in those uh, air molecules to rise around the meteor. So it's not friction, it's adiabatic change that burns up that meteor. What happens to atmospheric temperatures in the troposphere, remember the troposphere is the lowest below the stratosphere where we live, in the troposphere with increasing elevation? Well, they decrease. Temperatures increase, decrease with elevation. And rising air cools for two reasons. One, it expands and cools to decreasing air pressure. The other one is moves further away from the surface of the warm earth. And as the parcel of air rises, the total amount of energy present doesn't change, but it can be used to either maintain a constant temperature or work to expand the size of an air parcel. And as air expands, heat is distributed through a large volume, producing a cooling effect. And the dry adiabatic lapse rate is 10 degrees per 1,000 meters or per kilometer. So things cool by 10 degrees per a kilometer going up. And as air rises, its, its relative humidity increases and the air eventually becomes saturated. Ah, now we're getting ready for talk about weather because now we're talking about clouds. And precipitation will occur when which releases latent heat. And this latent heat counterbalances adiabatic cooling, which reduces the cooling weight. And the wet adiabatic lapse rate is six degrees per kilometer going um, up. So now we're starting to talk about some things that are important to know just as background before we talk about weather. So now we're talking about cloud formation. We've just talked about dry adiabatic lapse rate and wet adiabatic lapse rate. And let's, this is a real important diagram. It's really important to get this concept before we talk about weather in the next lecture. Clouds form when air rises, cools, and water condenses. So the reason you can see clouds is because they're actually um, liquid water, or frozen water, and not water vapor. Um, and water vapor um, has a surface to condense onto. So you can't just get a droplet of water without something for that water to stick to, like a, a, a piece of dust or a piece of smoke or a little salt particle or a pollutant. And um, so notice that you have a dry adiabatic lapse rate up to where the cloud level is, and above that because that's the clouds, you have a wet adiabatic lapse rate. In other words, that's how much the temperature decreases just because of um, change of air pressure on whether it's um, the air is saturated or the weather is not saturated. So again, where air is not saturated below that condensation line, and so that's how fast the temperature decreases going up in the atmosphere. And above that line, the air is saturated in that cloud and the wet adiabatic lapse rate or the decrease in temperature is not quite as steep. Uh, clouds are composed of tiny water droplets, billions of tiny water droplets, and eventually they can combine and form snow, hail, or, or rain. And heavier cloud droplets fall and collide and combine with other droplets to form raindrops. One raindrop, one raindrop contains about a million cloud droplets, so that's how tiny cloud droplets are. Um, pure water droplets in high clouds can remain liquid down to about um, minus 38 degrees Fahrenheit. And supercooled water will only freeze if it's agitated or has a surface to freeze on. So unless there's um, dust particles or smoke or something in that in that atmosphere to freeze on, the water will cool but it won't create water droplets and so clouds won't form. Well snow forms when clouds reach a temperature below minus 5 degrees centigrade and air needs a little less water vapor to be saturated for ice and for water or liquid water. Um, well condensation preferentially produces ice crystals uh, because it doesn't have to be saturated as much to produce ice and water. Um, miniature ice crystals can act as condensation surfaces. So if you get little ice crystals 
then you can get liquid water forming around those ice crystals. And if that happens, then you can have the ice crystals that act as condensation surfaces and gradually increases its size to form snowflakes. Well, it's really interesting because um, here you have snow that falls and builds around an ice crystal rather than around um, dust or something like that. And um, so next time you see a snowflake, you can think of, of what we just talked about. Uh, measurements reveal that a cubic meter of air at 12 degrees Celsius actually holds 6 grams of water. What happens if the temperature of the air increases? What happens is the absolute humidity remains constant and relative humidity decreases. And if you have to go back and look at that diagram of relative and absolute humidity in, a, in an earlier slide, that's really an important concept to, to get the difference between the two. And um, if, if you have to, go ask your mom about um, having a humidifier in the house and whether that's important in the winter and whether your skin cracks. Because that's because of relative humidity. Describe what would happen to a parcel of air that begins to rise and use the terms um, normal lapse rate, dry and wet adiabatic lapse rates, and humidity in that answer. Well, if a parcel is warmer than the surrounding air, it begins to rise. As the parcel of air begins to rise, pressure decreases and it expands and cools. If the air is unsaturated, the air cools at the dry lapse rate. As the air rises, humidity will increase. If it is saturated or when it becomes saturated, it cools at the saturated or wet lapse rate. One of the things that um, you may want to pay attention to next time you fly is on the summer day is notice that there's a cloud that tends to form. Some days clouds will form around every pond around every farmer's field. And the reason is is because there's more water evaporating from that pond and so the air gets saturated um, and, um, and, and clouds form and you begin um, having a wet adiabatic lapse rate where that saturation occurs at a lower um, level at that part of the atmosphere than the surrounding atmosphere. And so you just get a cloud around that, that pond or above that pond. Anyway, that, I think that's kind of interesting. And that's also true when you get fog. Um, fog is clouds on the ground. You might have fog over a pond for the same reason, just because you get more evaporation over that pond, and so you get um, um, saturated air, and the same answer we just read would apply to that parcel of air. Much of the incoming solar radiation is either absorbed by clouds or reflected back into space from their surfaces. And clouds can have a cooling effect due to the reflection of solar radiation or a warming effect due to absorption by water vapor, which is a greenhouse gas. Um, and at present, we don't know which effect is stronger. Um, we need to think about the different types of clouds and uh, I'd like you to learn the different types of clouds so you can recognize them if you don't already know these. You may have learned them in an earlier earth science back in eighth grade or something. But um, it's, it's just important, just in general knowledge, to know, to be able to recognize different clouds. So um, high, let's start at the bottom, start with low clouds. Um, lowest clouds next to the earth are flat or, or fog. And uh, those are, are flat types of clouds. And so those would be fog or stratus clouds or nimbostratus clouds. Um, and then also close to the surface of the Earth, you can have a cellular or a wavy or a cumuliform kind of cloud called stratocumulus, or, um, or a vertically developed cloud, which would be a cumulus cloud. And that'd be the puffy clouds you find in the summer. Um, then higher than um, that, like uh, two to six kilometers in the air, uh, you can get, uh, again, starting from the left to the right, flat clouds would be the nimbostratus or altostratus clouds, or cellular wavy clouds might be altocumulus clouds, or um, a really tall storm cloud um, would be a cumulonimbus cloud. And then um, 
<clears throat> clouds that are very high and uh, would be cirrus clouds, which are wispy kind of clouds and made of ice crystals, or cirrostratus clouds, or um, uh, cirrocumulus clouds, and you can have cumulonimbus clouds going on up into the very high part of the troposphere as well. Well, why does air rise? Well, air rises naturally if it is lighter than the surrounding air mass and um, because of density or convection lifting. So here we have a graph of altitude vertically and temperature. So altitude going up, temperature going up to the right. Well, the normal lapse rate is the um, orange line and the dry adiabatic lapse rate is the blue line. And notice that the, where the lines intersect is where an air mass stops rising because the normal lapse rate intersects with the dry adiabatic lapse rate. You remember dry adiabatic lapse rate is where you do not have saturated air. Again, why does air rise? Well, you have frontal lifting, two large air masses of different the different densities meet and their boundary is a front. So two types of air meet and that boundary is called a front. And um, so the lighter warm air rises above the denser colder air on that front. And here we have two fronts shown in one picture. One you have a, a cold front where you have warm air forced up above the cold air and that's where you get a lot of these storm clouds in the summer with big, tall, cumulolimbus uh, storm clouds. And air airplanes don't like to fly through those because they're they really are uh, high velocity wind storm kind of clouds. Um, and then a warm front on the right, it, you get um, <clears throat> warm air moving into cold air and then going up above that cold air and as that warm air rises it would form cirrus clouds or cirrus stratus clouds way up high in the atmosphere. Um, again why does air rise? Well you can also get orthographic lifting which is air is forced to rise over an obstruction such as a mountain or you can get convergence lifting where a collision of two masses of air of similar temperature um, forces some air upwards since both air masses can't occupy the same space. So two air masses just crash into each other. Someone, it has to go somewhere. Well, how, how high will unstable air rise? Well, it, until the temperature is the same as the surrounding air. So unstable air will rise until the temperatures are similar. Then let's classify the clouds here according to the following images. Well, A is cirrus clouds, those wispy cirrus clouds. Uh, B are alto cumulus clouds. Uh, C are cumulonimbus clouds. And D would be cirrostratus clouds. So, again, I, I think it's a good exercise for you to um, learn to recognize clouds just as general knowledge uh, because weather affects us all the time. In July um, 2nd, 1982, truck driver Larry Walters decided to attach 45 helium-filled weather balloons to a lawn chair and go for a ride. Uh, Larry was experimenting. Well, lawn chair Larry rose to an altitude of nearly 5 kilometers, or 16,000 feet. The high elevations and lack of oxygen made him dizzy. Uh, Larry didn't take a oxygen mask with him. So Larry decided it was time to deploy his principal attitude control device, a pellet gun, and he proceeded to shoot out several balloons and ascended back to Earth. Um, Larry may be a candidate for a Darwin Award, except he lived through this. So which process is most significant to launch Larry Larry's balloon ride, other than insanity? Well, density lifting. Um, density lifting uh, was the most significant to um, Larry. So th this is just to summarize the different types of lifting. You need to know the difference between these. If you need to go back and review those, that's important. Um, but Larry was just rising in the air until um, he wasn't 
rising because of mountains. He wasn't rising because of um, of air fronts coming through, and he, and he wasn't rising because of convergence of two different um, front, two different types of air or anything. Just density lifting. Um, <clears throat> let's talk about orthographic lifting here. In the following landscape: How would the amount of rainfall change at location X if the mountain eroded down to the dashed line? Well. The rainfall would increase because the wind would find it easier to go over that mountain and um, you wouldn't have as much density lifting and so you'd have more rainfall instead of rain shadow at X on the other side of the mountain. I use the information in the chapter to explain which airlifting mechanism dominates where you live and which states might provide examples of the four airlifting mechanisms. Well, density lifting can occur anywhere. Western states from California through the Rockies are influenced by more orthographic lifting. Convergence and frontal lifting are most likely in the Midwest and Eastern states. And let's define wind. Wind is the horizontal movement of air that arises from differences in air pressure. Air flows from air, areas of high pressure to areas of low pressure. So in the picture, we see wind going from east toward the west because high pressure is in the east and low pressure is in the west. And wind is characterized by its speed and direction. So how fast is the wind blowing and what direction is it blowing? Direction of the wind refers to where it originates. So if you have a, a east wind, it's blowing from the east. If you have a southwest <laughs> wind, then you have uh, it coming from the southwest. And then another term that's important to know is an isobar. And an isobar is a line of constant air pressure. And so you could um, you can measure the air pressure at multiple places and um, draw lines of similar barometric pressure. Um, and one of the nice things about a computer system in the internet is you can have immediate uh, feedback into the internet from different um, weather stations at every elementary or high school around the country that has a weather station and use that information to get very detailed um, isobar charts. A pressure gradient. Well, pressure gradient is the magnitude of change in the pressure between two points divided by the distance between those points. And the greater the contrast in the pressure, the steeper the gradient and the faster the winds. So the closer together to the isobars, the steeper the gradient, and the faster the winds. And uh, so the idea of pressure gradient is important when you're wondering how fast wind speed's going to be. And due, the, due to the Coriolis effect, in other words, the earth turning, uh, rotating, and uh, the atmosphere not being attached to the earth, but um, being affected as a, uh, as a, uh, unattached um, body but the earth moving under it. Due to the Coriolis effect, winds are deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere and eventually gradient, pressure gradient balances the Coriolis effect and winds move parallel to the isobars and we call that a geostrophic wind. Winds blowing near the earth's surface are slowed by frictional drag from the surface and as you might expect because rugged areas um, that have more friction, friction is more dramatic over those areas. And uh, so here we have a, a picture with a pressure gradient and, and how much the Coriolis affects, pre affects that pressure gradient. A couple important terms to know are what's called a cyclone and an anticyclone. And we're using terms from the um, northern hemisphere here when we talk about this. Well, a cyclone is when winds converge in a low pressure system and it creates a counterclockwise airflow at the surface. And an anticyclone is the opposite of that around a high pressure. And winds diverge in high pressure systems which create a clockwise airflow at the surface. So notice the arrows from the wind are coming toward the low pressure cell in a cyclone and the winds are moving away from the high pressure in the anticyclone. 
and uh, if you do take the um, average of those winds and how they're moving around, the winds will move uh, counterclockwise around the cyclone, uh, around the low pressure cell, and clockwise around the high pressure cell. And let's look at the map below. If the Earth did not rotate, wind would blow directly from the A to the C. So if we don't take the Coriolis effect into account, wind would go straight from A to C, and you can tell that because of where the pressure bars are. Notice that C has a pressure of, of 992, and A has a pressure of, it looks like, um, 1014. And so um, high A is a high, C is a low, and the air would dire go directly from a high, the high A to the low C.